In this video, I'm going to discuss with one of the most complicated topics in probability that students tend to uh, struggle with, and that is calculating probability when we're asked to find at least one something. So here in this example, we're told a couple has decided that they plan to have four children over the next many years, and we're going to assume that the chances of having a boy and girl is equal. So 50-50, 50% 50, 50 chance for each, or a probability of 0.5 for each, and that they have one child at a time, no twins, triplets, etc. We want to know the probability that they have at least one boy. Now I'm going to go through this problem first just using that sample space approach. Since we're talking about a couple having four children, it's not too challenging to go through and list out all of the, the possibilities. And I've already gone ahead and done that because you don't want to see me sit here and do it. So I assure you, this is all 16 possibilities, where there's all boys, all girls. Uh, there was a pattern, and then it kind of got rearranged. So th the best way to do it is to, to kind of go through a pattern. But anything with a B is a boy, anything with a G is a girl. So these are all the possible combinations. And we notice that you have to have 16, because, you know, having three boys and one girl if we think about this kind of ordering them from oldest to youngest, it matters the order. So that's kind of getting into more of a combinatorics approach to calculating probabilities and possibilities, but we're not going to talk about that. Just know these are the 16 possibilities. We know that if we wanted to calculate probability with a sample space approach, we're going to look for, we want to know the probability of at least one boy, so at least one boy, what we can do is go through, count the different combinations here that have at least one boy. So that could be one boy, two boys, three boys, or four boys. We're going to look to see out of these combinations which ones have at least one or have one, two, three, or four boys. And then we're going to divide that by 16, which is the number of elements in our sample space. Remember the sample space is all possibilities. So Let's go through, and I'm just going to put a little, little check mark about, um, next to the ones that satisfy this event, at least one boy. Well, here's all four. This one has at least one, at least one, at least one. This one does not. This is all girls, so I'm not going to check that. This does, this does, this does. We're just putting a check mark next to the ones that have at least one boy. So they have one, two, three, or four boys. Okay. So it looks like going through all of these, all of these that have a check mark have at least one B in them, which would represent a boy out of the four children. If I were to count these up, I would have 15. What I just found is the probability of having at least one boy. A sample space approach can get the answer, but it's not very efficient. Because now, what if I asked you, what's the probability of a couple if they had eight children? What's the probability that there's at least one boy? In that case, I assure you, you do not want to list out the sample space. So what can we do here? In other words, what can we, what sort of formula can we develop to solve this problem? Well, notice you have a few options here. The probability of having zero boys plus the probability of one boy plus the probability of two. Notice all of these this is the probability of having this many boys, is certain. So we're going to put that equal to 1. In other words, I know the probability of having no boys, 1, 2, 3, or 4, those are mutually exclusive events. I can't have one boy and have three boys. All right, Out of four children, if there's four children, you can't have one and have three at the same time. So since these are mutually exclusive, I know if I add them all up, I get 1, all the possibilities, and there's no overlap. When you're asked to find at least one boy, at least one boy, what you're looking for is this sum right here. You're looking for either one or two or three or four. All right, that's this is the sum that we just found. We just added up the probability of having one. We counted the, the number of observations where there's one, there's two, there's three, there's four. Notice, this is what I'm looking for. So I'm going to just replace this this whole underlined part with the probability of at least one. So 
So I see here the probability of having no boys plus the probability of having at least one is certain. This formula is incredibly helpful. This is the probability of having no or none plus the probability of at least one is equal to one. What this tells me is if I want to solve the probability for the probability of at least one, I actually can find the probability of none and subtract that from one. So this formula is telling you the probability of at least one is equal to one minus, if I were to subtract both sides here, subtract the probability of none. I would get the probability of at least one. Up above, we just went the more complicated and straightforward way of adding up all the possibilities. When in fact, what we could have also done is calculated the probability that there's no boys at all and then subtracted that from one. So in this corner, I'm going to do that. Now, why would that be an easier way to go about solving this problem? Well, the probability that there are no boys means there is a girl girl, girl, girl. That means the probability of that happening is one-half times one-half times one-half times one-half, which in this case is one-sixteenth. There's only one out of 16 possibilities here. This is similar to independent trials, right? This is the probability that the first selection or first child is a girl, the second child is a girl, the third child is a girl. These are independent trials. So this will be one half times one half times one half times one half. This is the probability that there is no boys. So if I take this and subtract from one, I get 15 sixteenths. Let's look at one more example. Okay, here's this example. A lamp manufacturer is interested in knowing what floors of his factory are proficient. In order to be considered proficient, you need to have a random sampling of five lamps and they must all be in working order. If the probability of randomly selecting just one defective lamp is 0.07, what is the probability that a floor fails this proficiency test? That's a lot of information, but it can be summed up just with this brief question. What's the probability that at least one lamp out of the five is defective? There's a lot of information going on in this problem. So what I'm going to do first is see if I can write down some of it, even without making any calculations. I know that there's a probability of 0.07. Let me switch to my pencil here. I know there's a probability of 0.07 that I get one defective lamp. One defective lamp, which means if I subtract that from one, right, because the complement is it's either defective or it's not. So if I subtract this from one, I get 0.93 that I have a working lamp. If you're unsure of how we got that, I would recommend looking back in the videos looking for complement. It's either defective or it's not. So if 0.07 is the probability that it's defective, then if I subtract 0.07 from one, I get that 0.93. In other words, there's a 93 percent chance that it's working. I'm looking for what's the probability that at least one lamp out of the five, at least one is defective. So what I am looking for, all right, I am looking for, and I can kind of write this out. Let's say we take five lamps, okay? We have five lamps and they are randomly sampled. There is, there are two possibilities out of these. With that at least one, I know that the probability of at least one is defective, knowing what I know about, oh, that's not how you spell defective. What I know about the relationship between at least one is defective or none are defective. No or none are defective. I know that these two events are mutually exclusive. Either at least one of the five, at least one, and maybe I should write that, of the five, at least one of the five is defective. 
Plus, none of them are defective. None of the five are defective. I know that's certain. All right, because we're either going to have you know, zero being defective, one being defective, two, three, four, or five. So one of these possibilities has to happen. Either zero R, one, two, three, four, or one of those R. So I'm looking for this sum right here. I'm looking for the sum of where there's one, there's two, there's three, there's four, or there's five. This is going to be a lot easier if we can just calculate the probability that none of them are and then subtract that from one. So let's find this. What's the probability that none of the five are defective? So the probability that none of the five are defective. These are independent trials. So I'm going to be multiplying something five times. So what's the probability that the first one is not defective? In other words, it's working. Well, if I randomly select one, the probability that the first one's working is 0.93. Now I randomly select another one. This is an independent trial. That's also going to be 0.93. And the next one is 0.93. And the next one is 0.93. And finally, the fifth one. The probability that all of them are working, that none of them are defective, that means all of them are working. So here, 0.93 to the fifth power is what I'm looking for. And this is going to be the probability that if I select five of them, all five are going to be working. In other words, all five are considered not defective. If you calculate that, and we're going to round this to the thousandths place here, 0.696. This is the probability that if I randomly select, if I randomly select five lamps, this is the probability that every single one of them works. 0.93 times 0.93 times 0.93. So the only other option, if I subtract, if I figure out how many, or excuse me, if I find the probability that none of them are defective, and now I subtract that from one. If I take 1 minus 0.696, I'm going to get my answer. So if I take 1 minus 0.696, you get 0 0.304. This is the probability that at least one of the five is defective. At least one is of the five is defective. Now let's kind of go back here. If you need to rewind the entire video to see why this formula works, please do. But I know with that at least one, when you're asked to find the probability of at least one, it's most likely going to be easier to calculate the complement of that, which is none. And in this case, we're talking, what's none? Well, here we were looking for at least one is defective, so the complement of that is there's none that are defective. And knowing what I know about these lamps, this is just a very straightforward calculation to calculate that none of them are defective. If none of them are defective, they all work. So that's 0 0.93, 0 0.93, 0 0.93, all the way do that five times. This is similar to that lollipop example. So if we can find the probability that none of them are working, then we just subtract that from one to get that at least one. We don't know if it's one or two or three or four or five. That's what we're calculating. As long as there's one or more, then it's going to fail this test. So the probability there is 0 0.304.